that, that code is going to keep hanging out in the upper right hand corner if you have yet to join. And if we've got 15 of you in, some of, some of you still need to join. We are going to be jumping ahead to what we would think of as modern conflicts that might be about religion. Uh, technically, for most historians, the Thirty Years' War is a modern conflict. But for most of us, when we use the term modern, uh, we mean in like, recent times, right? times when people are still alive that can remember some of these things happening. We are, of course, looking at religion and modern conflicts because we have that big question. Are so-called religious conflicts or wars of religion really about religion? Or are they maybe more about something else? The other reason that we learn about modern conflicts tied to religion is they've been some of the most persistent conflicts of the last hundred years. The conflict between the Israelis and Hamas in Gaza is one of those. And that conflict has been in the news several times a day, every day, since Hamas broke across the border into Israel, broke things, killed people, and took hostages. That's tied to one of the religious conflicts we're going to be learning about. And a famous conservative philosopher, he was in a lot of ways more a journalist than a philosopher, the late Christopher Hitchens said, I am absolutely convinced that religion is the main source of hatred in this world. And I know our focus for a lot of this has been on Christianity, but Hitchens was opposed to religion in general. Yeah, JC. It should be. But it isn't cycling through like it. Actually, it's way off from where it should be. Thank you, JC, for telling me that. Maybe now it'll catch up. Yeah. Okay. Thank you again, JC. Now, Christopher Hitchens, I mean, he was opposed to religion. He was famous as an atheist. His brother was also somewhat famous as um, a proponent of Christianity. He disagreed very strongly with his brother, um, and made it a point to say that when he was diagnosed with terminal cancer, and that is ultimately what killed him, that he would not be one of those people who hedged their bets on their deathbed by seeking salvation. But, and you may decide you agree with Christopher Hitchens, right? but we do have a but to deal with, and that is right, we've already seen a mixture of motives in previous religious conflicts. In the Crusades, we had those merchants who wanted to make money dealing with Muslims. We had peasants who wanted to get away from manners. We had nobles who were interested in land and would fight other Christian crusading nobles for control of that land. In the Thirty Years' War, we saw Gustavus Adolphus who wanted to protect German Protestants but also wanted to keep the Holy Roman Empire weak and make Sweden a great power. So the job is to sort out which motives are most important. 
Now, the conflicts we're going to look at, obviously, you've probably already figured out, we're going to talk about Ireland. Now, we're going to focus on Ireland's conflict in the 20th century. We're going to have to get some background. It's going to go back a ways. And we're also going to talk about Ireland in the 21st century. Kind of the same story for Zionism. That conflict is really centered uh, on the world after World War II, but it, it's got that direct connection to what's going on in Israel or between Israel and Hamas right now. And then we have Islamic fundamentalist or Islamist terrorism from the mid 1900s on up to the present. And Hamas storming across the border with Israel on October the 7th would fit with one of those examples of terrorism. We need just a little bit of a refresher on motives. And I know they were just in your due now. They'll be in your exit slip again, but some of us are still a little shaky. We're always going to be looking at the same three. The public motives, the reasons we tell people are the reasons we do what we do. The private motives that aren't bad, but not the ones we broadcast to other people to explain ourselves. And then, of course, the final category and our ulterior motives or those secret reasons, the bad, either because they are at least self-interested. Commonly, that's referred to more as being selfish. or otherwise bad motives right, that we work to make sure other people don't learn about. Bless you, Justin. Okay. Our objectives, we need to know the basics of the conflicts and we need to understand their historical background. How did they get started? As with our other conflicts, we need to know who are the players, who are the main groups that are involved in each conflict. Again, something we've seen before, we need to understand the mixed motivations that drive those groups and what they do in each of the conflicts. And we are mostly, we're going to be talking about groups. There are going to be a few instances where we will bring out individuals, but for the most part, we're going to learn about groups. Okay, leaders matter, but if you guys have the big picture... Later, if some individual leader pops up in the news or you come across them in a book, you're going to have that context for understanding them. That's what I'd much rather you have than memorized knowledge of a specific person. And I want you to have that bigger picture in the context because I want you to be able to judge for yourself the balance of people's motivations. What's more important? Is it religion? Is it politics? Is it wealth? So that ultimately you can make your own argument about religious conflicts. Are they really religious or are they about other things? And religion's only a smaller part of what's going on.
I just want to be clear about that because none of what I'm trying to do is to brainwash you to think that when people say they're doing something for religion, that it has to be something else. There are people for whom uh, religion really is their driving motivation. All right, and now to Ireland. For our background, we have to briefly go way, way back to something we talked about at the beginning of the year, and that's the Roman Empire. And most of you are probably going to be happy to hear that all we need to know about the Roman Empire is that it's during this era that Christianity comes to Ireland. Remember, at this time there is only one Christian church, but later the type of Christianity that's going to be most common in Ireland is what we call today Roman Catholic. And then we're going to jump ahead of ways. And that's going to happen to us in this part of the course. We want the important details. Under Henry VIII, that English king we have already met, the one who is either famous or infamous, depending on what you focus on, whether it's him as the founder of the Church of England or as the guy who had his wife's heads chopped off, Whichever way you think of him or remember him, he is that Henry VIII. Under his rule, he conquered, well, England conquered all of Ireland. Ireland is, and we've seen it before, uh, but just as a reminder, it is a smaller island that sits to the west of the island that includes England, Wales, and Scotland. But, as I told you before... Henry VIII saying that England was going to be Protestant and have its own Protestant church did not mean that the Catholics disappeared or just accepted that they were going to be living under Protestant rule from now on. The Irish rebelled. They caused a lot of problems for the English. So Henry VIII's daughter becomes Queen Elizabeth I after One of Henry VIII's other daughters, Mary I, dies. She implements an English attempt to solve the problem. And it was called the Plantations Program. When Americans hear about plantations, you probably have an image of a big white house with columns, with a cotton plantation, and... African-American slaves being forced right, to work in those fields. Not that kind of plantation. In this program of plantations, the English took away land from rebellious Catholics. And then they gave it to Protestants from Scotland and England. I know I told you that a lot of Scots were Catholic. That's true. Protestantism also was something that some Scots were persuaded by. Groups like the Presbyterians. So you take the land from the rebellious Catholics and you give it to Protestant Scots and English because they're going to be loyal to you. You just gave them land. Somebody gives you Um, a chunk of land, especially if you didn't have land of your own before in England or Scotland, you're going to be happy with that person, and you are going to want to support them. And that's more, when you think about plantations, think about it more as planting Scots and English Protestants in Ireland to displace the Catholics. Elizabeth also assumes that it's going to get a lot cheaper to fight the Irish Catholics in Ireland. Because instead of England having to send armies, the colonists will fight the Irish Catholics to protect that land. If they don't protect the land, they lose it. So they've got every reason to do England's fighting without England having to send soldiers.
Now, I want you to look at those options and tell me, right, by selecting one of them, which, well, what would we call the plantations program if it were happening in 2023? Most of you going for counterinsurgency. Second hour was more kind of evenly split across the three answers. Counterinsurgency certainly could be it. Okay, so counterinsurgency is how you fight a rebellion. Another way of referring to rebels is as insurgents. So anything you do to counter a rebellion could be seen as counterinsurgency. And one way of doing that is through reservations. Right? You concentrate the hostile, you can put that in air quotes if you want to, um, population on reservations, which are set aside pieces of land where you're going to put all of them. That's how the United States government ran a counterinsurgency against Native Americans, especially in the Western United States. And you take the population you see as hostile, you move them off of the land they're currently on, and you put them somewhere else where you can bottle them up and you know where they are and you can control them. But both of these examples are instances of ethnic cleansing. So ethnic cleansing is, if there is a truly right answer here, this is the closest one to it. In ethnic cleansing, you are trying to remove some other ethnicity entirely from an area so that you can control it with people from your own ethnicity. And that's what's happening here. Ethnicity can be lots of different things. In this case, it more likely meant English speaking and Protestant. Right, you're going to push out the Irish and you're going to replace them with people who look and talk and believe like you. Which is also what the United States government did to the Native Americans. And that is Definitely ethnic cleansing um, and also an attempted genocide. I'm going to take another big skip ahead. Remember that Queen Elizabeth is only reigning until the beginning of the 17th century. We're going to skip ahead to the beginning of the 19th century or 1800s. At this point, Ireland is not just conquered territory, it becomes an official part of the United Kingdom. That's why the full title of the United Kingdom today is the United Kingdom of England, Wales, and Scotland, and Northern Ireland. Not Well, yes, Northern Ireland. That's skipping ahead a little bit, too. We'll get to why there's a Northern distinction in a bit. In the second half of that same century, Catholics in Ireland start trying to work for home rule within the United Kingdom. Home rule means that you're not leaving the United Kingdom. You still accept that you're going to be a part of the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom will still run foreign policy. If the United Kingdom wants to declare war on Germany, it can do that. Ireland can't stop it. At the same time, Ireland can't declare war on Germany. Ireland doesn't, wouldn't have any control over its own foreign policy, its relations with other countries, but it would be able to run things within Ireland. Right? So it would be able to govern itself at home. That's hence the home rule. Now, to connect this to our own experience, something you know I hope more about than Ireland, 
How were the demands of the Irish like the demands of America's founders, and how were they different? How were the Irish demands like those of our founders, and how were they different? I'm going to see we've got a three-minute timer running on this. I don't want you guys to panic. I'm not expecting polished paragraphs. An answer I got today that was spot on was 15 words. That's it. Okay, and I'm seeing some question. The Irish demand was for home rule. So governing yourself, but not independent. That was the Irish demand. Highlighted a few answers here. The key difference is how far they take it. So they both want more freedom, but America wanted to be fully independent and separated from the United Kingdom. Okay, and so that is the true independence versus the Irish who just wanted to be able to control things within Ireland. They're not asking to break away from the United Kingdom. They just want to be able to call the, their own shots in their own territory. So again, we get that same distinction. America wanted full independence, full separation from the British uh, and home rule that the Irish were seeking is not that full separation. And the Irish want this because they're angry. Now, I know some. this is when somebody thinks about that stereotypical presentation of the Irish as people who are always angry. Uh, well, they're not. And like any stereotype, you can find angry Irish people, but I'm sure you can find some angry reindeer herder up in northern Finland. And even though they're known for being very peaceful, I'm sure you can find angry people and non-angry people in every group. The Irish are angry because they've got a good reason to be angry in the middle of the 1800s. That's because of the potato famine. You guys all learned about the potato famine at some point. It was that period where a million Irish died due to the famine. Remember, famine means widespread shortage of food. 
and many Irish left. They went to Canada, they went to the United States, they went to Australia, and they went lots of places. And that, for that reason, just for you to understand how extreme this is, Ireland is the only country I can think of that has a smaller population in 2023 than it had in 1845. They've, their population has never recovered. They lost so many people. But you're all like, we know about this. The potato blight killed the potatoes. Irish only had potatoes to eat, and they lost their only food, and they all died. Well, that's not actually correct. There's other food in Ireland. They, don't, they didn't just grow potatoes. And if you're imagining that they were really, really boring eating so many potatoes, uh, they had good potatoes, right? Very flavorful, nutritious potatoes. These aren't like the giant russet potatoes you see at the grocery store. They had good potatoes, and they also had things like barley. They had dairy. They had other food that they could have eaten. But the government of the United Kingdom in London forced the Irish to continue to export that other food to England. And so the Irish had to keep feeding England even while they couldn't feed themselves. And that's why so many people starved to death. I'm not saying no people would have starved to death without it, right? but that's how you hit a million. So they're angry, right? It's not the potato blight that killed them. It's the English who killed them, and that's how they see it. That's the injury, and this is the insult added to injury. They also faced a lot of prejudice. And it wasn't, of course, just from the English. The Irish faced a lot of, um, a lot of prejudice in the United States as well. I will never be able to forget a political cartoon um, that describes, it's got this creature in a cage, and people are looking at it, and there's a placard on the cage that says, um, Irish American dynamite skunk, and that was how they refer to them. Right? It's, they're not human. They're less than us, and that's the depiction here, right? The British portraying the Irish as monkeys, right? and that cone there is a dunce cap, and you, that was what used to be put on the heads of somebody who had done something wrong or didn't get the answers right, and you did that to humiliate them and let everybody know that that person um, couldn't behave or couldn't get the answers right. That's how the Irish are depicted, right? less than human, right, and not bright. And it was specifically directed at Catholics. If you were a Catholic, I know we talked earlier about how the English Bill of Rights let Protestants but not Catholics own guns, um, Catholics also weren't allowed to be in the legislature, right? the part of the government that makes the laws until 1829. Now we jump ahead again to 1916. 1916 is a really important year in Ireland for two reasons. One, it is the year of the Easter Rising, which is shown in this picture down here. The Easter Rising happened, not surprisingly, around Easter. Actually, it was the Easter Rising. And here, Irish Catholics launched an armed rebellion against British rule. And this time, they want full independence. They want an Irish Republic. And that means republic as we've always used it, um, a representative democracy. But it also means something else in this context. Republic means getting rid of the king or the queen. Britain still is not a republic because it still has a monarchy. Right? Canada, our dear and usually not associated with being angry neighbors to the north, they are not a republic. They have representative democracy, but they're not a republic because right, they still recognize uh, the English king or queen as their head of state. And the Irish were trying to get rid of the British monarchy. 
Another thing that's happening is World War I. And World War I is from 1914 to 1918. And key battle of that year, the Battle of the Somme, we'll see fighting by the Ulster Division of the UK Army. Uh, which reminds me, we missed something on that previous slide back there, didn't we? Skip back to here. Oops. All right, and that was that the plantations were most successful in Ulster. Yeah, I'll leave that up there, and then I'll put it back. You guys need to go do your exit slip. As soon as you get that done, it is the same as the do now. I will extend the time on that, the lock times that you have up until 11 o'clock to get that done so that everybody can finish their notes and still take the exit slip. Because we are an exit slip time, make sure that we're not talking. I would love for you guys to get to day 18, but you've still got to get there on your own.